people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. In line with country's consistent endeavors to accomplish a speedy growth, India recently launched the National Logistics Policy. The policy is aimed at cutting down on country's logistics costs from nearly 14% to single digit. The policy has been hailed across the spectrum for it will not just have a growth component associated with it, but will also provide a greater hope to the domestic manufacturers who were lagging in the global market competition owing to higher costs. India has already established a reputation as that of a pathfinder among economists due to its recent unrivaled economic growth. The new national logistics policy is an evolution in this thought process and may have just added another gear to increase economic growth. Aimed at bringing down logistic costs and improving the competitiveness of domestic goods in the global market, the national logistics policy is expected to pave a seamless path for economic growth in the country. India currently spends between 13 to 14 percent of its GDP on logistics. This is far more than developed countries who spend between 8 to 9 percent on logistics. Indian domestic goods introduced to the global market are inherently disadvantaged because of these high logistics costs. A holistic policy overhaul will bring the change Indian manufacturers have been hoping for, which would enable them to price their products competitively in the global market. Ulip launch hua hai. Usse niriyat ko ko is lambi prakriya se mukti milegi. Ulip ट्रांसपोर्टेशन सेक्टर से जुड़ी सभी डिजिटल सेवाओं को एक ही प्लेटफॉर्म पर लेकर आए दिस न्यू लॉजिस्टिकल प्रोजेक्ट हैज फोर की कंपोनेंट्स यूनिफाइड लॉजिस्टिक्स इंटरफेस प्लेटफॉर्म इंटीग्रेशन ऑफ डिजिटल सिस्टम ईज ऑफ लॉजिस्टिक्स एंड सिस्टम इंप्रूवमेंट ग्रुप 30 डिस्टिंक्ट सिस्टम्स फ्रॉम सेवन डिफरेंट डिपार्टमेंट्स आर कंबाइंड अंडर द इंटीग्रेशन ऑफ डिजिटल सिस्टम कंपोनेंट including information from the departments of road transportation, railroads, customs, aviation and commerce. Experts opine that successful implementation of the program's policies will have profound effects on the country's logistical operations. So, for example, we believe that, as we are going to the Guwahati railway line, there are 2,000 kilometers of the दो ढाई ढाई हजार किलोमीटर की रेलवे लाइन में करीब बीच में नब्बे पंचानवे किलोमीटर में सिंगल ट्रैक उस सिंगल ट्रैक के होने की वजह से दिन भर में जो रेक की एफिशिएंसी है वो कम हो जाती है पंद्रह रेक पर डे की स्पीड भर जाएगी यदि उसको डबल लाइन कर दिया जाए The National Logistics Policy adds another element to the successful policy implementation of Make in India, Digital India, and the Atmanir Bharta push in the country. Experts say that improved logistic policies, which will allow for the seamless transportation of goods, will not only enhance Make in India, Digital India, and the indigenization push, but will also act as a force multiplier for the entire economic ecosystem. Improved logistics will also support the efforts of the Gati Shakti Initiative, which has enabled different ministries to collaborate under one roof to accomplish the shared goal of the nation's growth. India has experienced great economic growth, just recently overtaking the United Kingdom to become the world's fifth largest economy. However, the country has its sights set on many more economic milestones in years to come. In order to achieve its aims, integrated efforts across all sectors are required. India aims to become a developed country by 2047. To do so, India cannot rely on only incremental growth. This is India's moment. Some say it is India's decade and even century. And New Delhi is capitalizing on the opportunity. It is time for brand India to further expand and flourish. Moving on. 
As Sri Lanka finds itself in the throes of its darkest economic crisis, millions of people in the country are battling a calamitous decline in the living standards. Rampant inflation, snaking fuel queues and shortages of essentials such as food and medicine have driven many Sri Lankans into poverty. The desperation among the masses is growing in the country as major financial assistance is still months away. Take a look. Nestled in the hills of Sri Lanka's central province, Norwood is home to almost 100 tea pickers like Amasi Geetha and another 91 workers who carry out other duties. Most of them live and die on the estate. According to the Sri Lanka's statistics department, the country's worst economic crisis in decades, rampant inflation has caused food prices to rise by 93.7%. However, the basic pay rate for tea workers has remained the same in Norwood at 2.79 US dollars for 40 pounds of tea leaves. The 38-year-old widowed mother Geetha is the sole breadwinner of her family of four children aged between 3 to 15. But the economic crisis has pushed her to unprecedented hardship. On top of her meager pay, she skips lunch and only sips water while her fellow tea pickers sit down to eat, saving what little food she has for her children. Poverty is not new to Sri Lanka's tea estate workers, but the economic crisis and its impacts on food and education make them fear that there will be no way out of their situation, with future generations forced to continue living in never-ending cycle of hardship. The vast majority of these workers are descended from Tamil indentured labourers who were shipped by the British from India to Sri Lanka during colonial times to work on tea plantations. Like her mother, who was also a tea picker, Geetha built her family's lives within the tea estate, living in a cramped, British-built line house. Several of them say amidst the financial crisis, they are forced to send their children to work in order to repay loans borrowed from people within the community. After Sri Lanka gained independence in 1948, the government denied Indian Tamil citizenship classifying them as temporary migrants from India. It was not until 2003 that citizenship was granted to Indian Tamils who had been residing in Sri Lanka since 1964 and their descendants. These workers and thousands others have been burdened with more than one challenge since the outbreak of the forex crisis. Whether it is tea plantation workers, fishermen or vegetable vendors, everybody is affected. On one side there is economic crisis, on another acute discrimination is prevalent in parts of the island nation. This adds to the months of severe politico-economic crisis the country has been reeling under. While the lifestyle of Sri Lankans has dipped by several notches in past few weeks, it remains to be seen if government intervenes in the rapidly deteriorating situation in these areas. Moving on, 
China and Pakistan share a common objective to prevent India's rise and their diplomatic interests have been cemented by China-Pakistan economic corridor. This growing nexus factor has not received adequate attention to the potential role it plays in the rising threat of conflicts in South Asia. By repeatedly shielding Pakistan-based terrorists, Beijing is thwarting the Indian and global efforts to counter terrorism. China blocked a motion in the UN to designate Lashkari Taiba terrorist Abdul Rahman Maki as a global terrorist. Jaishi Mohammed terrorist Abdul Rauf Azar was saved from sanctions in August. And now, 2611 mastermind Sajid Mir has also found assistance from the Chinese. China has blocked a joint India-United States attempt to blacklist Pakistan-based terrorist Sajid Mir under the 1267 Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee of the UN Security Council as a global terrorist. China defends its actions as so-called technical objections based on procedural loopholes. However, it is an open secret that they have a clear pattern of protecting Pakistan internationally. Beijing's actions expose its hypocrisy and double standards when it comes to the international community's shared battle against terrorism. Political considerations, unfortunately, prevent the sanctions committee from achieving their intended aims, thus derailing the efforts to fight terrorism. At the UN Security Council briefing on Ukraine's fight against impunity, India, while taking aim at China, strongly cautioned against the politics of protecting terrorists. Politics should never, ever provide cover to evade accountability, nor indeed to facilitate impunity. Regrettably, we have seen this of late in this very chamber when it comes to sanctioning of some of the world's most dreaded terrorists. Diplomatically, China has provided almost unwavering support for Pakistan at the United Nations. Meanwhile, Pakistan assumes that their friendship is as sweet as honey and as deep as the sea. And to prove its loyalty to Beijing, Pakistan has forfeited territory and sovereignty. Pakistan, facing economic and political uncertainty, has relied upon Chinese loans. China is enjoying many benefits under its Belt and Road Initiative in Pakistan. However, it seems that the real impetus behind Pakistan and China's relationship is in attempting to keep their common rival, India, off balance. While Beijing attempts to counter India by keeping tensions on the boil in its neighborhood, Pakistan and their nefarious intelligence wing, the ISI, spread misinformation against New Delhi. Islamabad attempts to mislead the global community with baseless and malicious propaganda against India. All successive governments in the Islamic Republic have used Kashmir as a scapegoat in its shameful diplomatic approach against India. Pakistan continues to parrot its own flawed narrative on Kashmir globally as an attempt to divert attention from the state of affairs in their country and from their own actions. Pakistan's economy is on the verge of crisis and the recent floods have displaced and killed many. And still, Kashmir seems to be the topic of choice for Pakistan's leaders. A typical Pakistani case of mistaken priorities. A polity that claims it seeks peace with its neighbors would never sponsor cross-border terrorism. Nor would it shelter planners of the horrific Mumbai terrorist attack, disclosing their existence only under pressure from the international community. Blinded by Chinese promises of economic prosperity and friendship, the current government in Pakistan is destroying its chances of ever being viewed as legitimate in the global community. Pakistan can continue to ignore the needs of its people and tout its unfounded narrative against India. India will continue to prosper and will continue to hold Pakistan and China accountable globally. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. Taiwan will end its mandatory COVID-19 quarantine for arrivals from October 13 and welcome tourists back, the government said this week, completing a major step in its plans to reopen to the outside world. Taiwan had cut its quarantine requirement for arrivals from 7 to 3 days in June, but kept its other entry and quarantine rules in place, even as large parts of the rest of Asia relaxed or lifted theirs completely. 
People said they looked forward to traveling abroad again after two years and were happy Taiwan was reopening along with the rest of the world. Throughout the pandemic, Taiwanese citizens and foreign residents were not prohibited from leaving and re-entering, but they had to quarantine at home or in hotels for up to two weeks. Taiwan has reported 6.3 million domestic cases since the beginning of the year, driven by the more infectious Omicron variant, with more than 99% of its cases showing no or only mild symptoms. As movement restrictions and live fire exercises have stepped up, the situation facing pupils in one of the most vulnerable communities in the West Bank has become increasingly difficult, with all four schools in the area under threat of demolition. Since schools reopened in late August, the military has intensified its curbs on movement by holding students and teachers at checkpoints, sometimes for hours, only to then prevent them from passing through. International bodies, including the United Nations and the European Union, have expressed concern about the situation at Masa Ferieta, which has seen a series of visits from diplomatic delegations over the past few months. Israel declared about 7,400 acres in South Hebron Hills as close military zone in the 1980s, known as Firing Zone 918. In court, it argued that the Palestinians living there at the time were only seasonal dwellers. The Palestinian residents who have led a distinct rural way of life for generations and rights groups say many of the Palestinian families were living permanently in the area even before Israel captured the West Bank in a 1967 Middle East war. Japan's famous Tokyo Game Show 2022 was organized after a span of three years due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is a platform where visitors can play games using virtual reality and motion technology. Around 605 different companies from 37 countries and regions displayed a wide variety of electronic games. We create motion experiences, motion games, and like what we're showing here is some motion music rhythm games, and then we have a motion-based party games, we have motion-based driving games. So we create games that will bring people together. It's also very accessible that you don't need any controllers to do to play. You only need to play the games with your body. So this is the type of games that we create. Total Game Show being one of the biggest game shows in the world, we're coming here and want to bring our games to the Asian market. We're going to bring our games to Japan. Previously, the Tokyo Game Show introduced video games that were connected to the television, followed by portable games and online games using the internet. The introduction of virtual reality games is the latest addition to the list. One of the characteristics of this game show is the exhibition of products in the environment where users play games. A major Japanese furniture maker Nitori is aiming for a business opportunity. The Tokyo Game Show is a major contributor to the growth of the Japanese gaming industry. The world's leading Japanese game industry continues to expand its business by developing games using the latest technology for all ages. The logistics industry is paying attention to technology that automates work. Automation technology can bring efficiency and solve challenges that Japanese industries face. あと、コロナ禍というので、人を集めたくないような環境、あとは人が集まらないような環境に自動化というものを求められております。マップと言われるマッピングを取って、その上に交通ルールを埋め込んで、で、ここに行き、あそこに行き、もしくはここに出てき
the know-how of generating power cultivated in its long history contributes to the technology of full automation. The industrial arm type robot uses image processing and AI technology to identify uneven packages and efficiently pick them up. The fusion of the spirit of manufacturing and the latest technology of AI will evolve logistics technology. Moving on. India's colorful culture is at its best during the nine-day-long Navratri celebrations that have begun across the country. Celebrated in the bright half of the Hindu calendar month Ashwin, which typically falls in the Gregorian months of September and October, Navratri is one of the most revered festivals in the Hindu religion. Though the festival is celebrated in different ways, the core reason behind the celebration remains the same. That is, the victory of good over evil. Let's have a look at this year's Navratri celebration. Devotees across India throng temples as the Hindu festival of Navratri or the festive nine nights has begun in the country with religious fervor. Navratri, derived from the ancient Sanskrit words nine nights, is being celebrated this year from September 26th to October 5th. Moreover, millions of devotees swarm temples to offer prayers and observe fasts as part of an occasion that is dedicated to all nine forms of Goddess Durga, the destroyer of evil. In Jammu and Kashmir's Katra town, the Vaishnava Devi shrine is seeing a heavy rush of pilgrims who are turning up in large numbers to offer prayers and seek blessings. दो तीन साल से रेगुलर आते हमारे गांव के दस बारह बंदे आते और दर साल हम ऐसा नया ऊर्जा और नया उन्मंग लेके आते हैं और दर साल एकदम बहुत ही खुश होता दिल से और पूरे साल भर उसकी एनर्जी रहती है आज का दिन ही क्यों चुना गया आज का पूरा साल से हम आज के दिन का इंतजार करते हैं नवरात्रि इस सिग्निफिकेंट हिं during which nine forms of the goddess Durga are worshipped. During the sacred period of Navratri, people observe fasts and some restrict their diet to fruits and vegetables, spurning meat, onions and garlic. The temples are beautifully decorated with flowers, leaves, petals, lights and the priests ornate idols of goddess Durga with new clothes and jewellery. Devotees queued up outside the Jhandewala temple in New Delhi to seek the blessings of Goddess Durga, where the priests performed special rituals in front of the idols. According to Hindu mythology, Goddess Durga represents power, the feminine force which guides and destroys all evil on earth. The festival is all about the annual visit of the Goddess Durga with her children to the ancestral home on earth. Navratri culminates on the 10th day, coinciding with the Deshera festival with the killing of demon king Ravan, signifying the victory of good over evil. In several states, the celebrations are marked by a unique blend of dance and devotion. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.